Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Linwood Community Church. This is, uh, the people call it Easter weekend, Holy Week. Uh, there's so many names for this, this uh, very special week in, in the year. And uh, sorry, I, I look a little weather beaten and war torn, and, and that's because I am. And uh, I sort of feel a little bit like Moses when he was coming down after seeing the burning bush and his hair had changed and it was all white and, you know, just beaten from the sun and did get a pretty nice tan out in the hundred and something degree weather it felt like out here in the desert. Wind blowing, so don't, don't worry about my hair. So I just call it my Moses look today and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm good with that. So, uh, Listen, uh, Tim and I are here today to do our, our devotional. Uh, for those of you who go online and, and follow the Bible study, the Bible study is done for this week, but I'm going to hold off for another week. It's a big week. People are going to be uh, doing a lot with their church. I know we have stuff going on, I believe, 7 o'clock. Uh, uh, tomorrow, Friday, we have a special service, you know, communion and fellowship. And, and then we got Sunday, and we got, you know, sunrise service and, and so there's a lot of th- stuff going on with a lot of churches. So I will post the Bible studies um, following week. And it just means that I'm, a, I'm, I'm ahead of the game, So because that's done. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this uh, opportunity today to share a devotional centered around, um, around Friday. And, uh, and Lord, it's a, it was a special Friday for the world. Uh, an even more special Sunday for the world, Lord. So uh, today I've got a few stories I want to share, so just open the hearts up of those that are listening. We ask it in your name. Amen. Storytelling day, because these stories are directly related to uh, the cross and Jesus and some of the things that, uh, that stick in your mind are when a story's told, if you really like that story, the meaning sticks in your, in your mind. So we're going to do three stories today. Uh, the first one, uh, and then actually before I, I start the first one, uh, there's two verses that, that uh, pop, popped into my mind uh, before I did all, any of these stories. And, and I, I just want to read uh, John 15, 13. It says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life. For his friends. And of course, John 3 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's what this weekend's about. It's about sacrifice. And it's about sacrificing the only begotten Son of God. Uh, for us, for all of us, for the world, for humanity. Uh, the first story is called The Sun. And it was, uh, I think, believe it was unanimous, or not unanimous, it was an- anonymous. I got my musts mixed up. Um, and it goes like this. A wealthy man and his son loved to collect rare, inspirational works of art. They had everything in their collection, from Picasso to Raphael. They would often sit together, sharing stories about the great works of art. When the Vietnam conflict broke out, the son went to war. He was very courageous and died in battle while rescuing another soldier. The father was notified and grieved deeply for his only son. About a month later, just before Christmas, There was a knock at the door. A young man stood at the door with a large package in his hands. 
He said, Sir, you, you don't know who I am, but I'm a soldier for whom your son gave his life. He saved many lives that day, and he was carrying me to safety when a bullet struck him in the heart, and he died instantly. He often talked about you and your love for inspirational art. The young man held out his package. I know this isn't much, but not, and I'm not really a great artist, but I think your son would have wanted you to have this. The father opened the package. It was a portrait of his son, painted by the young man. He stared in awe at the way the soldier had captured the personality of his son in the painting. The father was drawn to the eyes that his own eyes welled up with tears. He thanked the young man and offered to pay him for the portrait. Oh no, sir, I could never repay what your son did for me. It's a gift. The father hung the portrait over his mantle, and every time visitors came to the home, he took them to see the portrait of his son. Even before he showed them any of the other great works that he had collected. The man died a few months later. There was to be a great auction of his paintings. Many influential people gathered, excited over seeing the great inspirational paintings and having an opportunity to purchase one for their collection. On the platform sat the painting of the sun. The auctioneer pounded his gavel. We will start the bidding with the portrait of the sun. Who will bid for this painting? There was silence. Then a voice in the back of the room shouted, we want to see the famous painting, skip this one. But the auctioneer persisted. Will someone bid for this painting? Who will start the bidding? 100, 200. Another voice shouted angrily, we didn't come here to see this painting. We came to see the Van Goghs, the Rembrandts. Get on with the real bids. But still, the auctioneer continued. The sun, the sun, who will take the sun? Finally, a voice came from the very back of the room. It was the longtime gardener of the man and his son. I'll give $10 for the painting. Being a poor man, it was all he could afford. We have $10. Who will bid 20 Give it to him for 10 they shouted. Let's see the masters. $10 is the bid. Won't someone bid 20 The crowd was becoming angry. They didn't want the painting of the sun. They wanted the more worthy investments for their collections. The auctioneer pounded the gavel. Going once, going twice, sold for $10. A man sitting on the second row shouted, All right, now let's get, let's get on with the good collection. The auctioneer laid down the gavel. I'm sorry, the auction is over. When I was called to conduct this auction, I was told of a secret stipulation in the will. I was not allowed to reveal that stipulation until this time. Only the painting of the sun would be auctioned. Whoever bought that painting would inherit the entire estate, including the inspirational paintings. The man who took the sun gets everything. God gave his son 2,000 years ago to die on a cruel cross. Much like the auctioneer, his message today remains the same. The sun, the sun, who will take the sun? That was very powerful when I read that. I said this is a, a, great, a great Easter, uh, Easter uh, story. And it is, it is a gift. And it, is, uh, it was something special that he gave his son. And all the, all the gold and all the money in the world couldn't match that gift for us, especially. The next one is a it's a little little bit of a heartbreaker, but it but again, uh, the ending is relevant. But the uh, the story's the story's a little bit of a heartbreaker. So if, if I happen to tear up a little bit, forgive me. It's just it's um it's, it's a very it's a very meaningful story. Uh, and it's, it's called Jeremy's Egg. Jeremy's Egg. Jeremy was born with a twisted body, a slow mind, and a chronic terminal illness 
that had been slowly killing him all his young life. Still, his parents had tried to give him a normal life as possible, an, as normal a life as possible, and they sent him to St. Teresa's Elementary School. At the age of 12, Jeremy was only in the second grade, seemingly unable to learn. His teacher, Doris Miller, often became exasperated with him. He would squirm in his seat, drools, and make grunting noises. And other times, he spoke clearly and distinctly, as if a spot of light had penetrated the darkness of his brain. Most of the time, however, Jeremy irritated his teacher. One day she called his parents and asked them to come to St. Teresa's for consultation. As the foresters sat quietly in the empty classroom, Dora said to them, Jeremy really belongs in a special school. It isn't fair to him to be with the younger children who don't have learning problems. Why, there is a five-year gap between his age and that of all the other students, Miss Forster said. Or the teacher said. And Miss Forster cried softly into a tissue while her husband spoke. Miss Miller, he said, there is no school of that kind nearby. It would be a terrible shock for Jeremy if we had to take him out of this school. We know he really likes it here. Dora sat for a long time after they left, staring at the snow outside the window. Its coldness seemed to seep into her soul. She wanted to sympathize with the Forsters. After all, their only child had a terminal illness. But it wasn't fair to keep him in her class. She had 18 other youngsters to teach, and Jeremy was a distraction. Furthermore, he would never learn to read or write. Why waste any more time trying? As she pondered the situation, guilt washed over her. The Holy Spirit began to speak to her. Oh, God, she said aloud, here I am complaining, but my problems are nothing compared to that poor family. Please help me to be more patient with Jeremy. From that day on, she tried hard to ignore Jeremy's noises and his blank stares. And then one day, he limped to her desk, dragging his bad leg with him. I love you, Miss Miller, he exclaimed, loudly enough for the whole class to hear. The other children snickered, and Doris's face turned red. She stammered, why, why, that's very nice, Jeremy. Now please take your seat. Spring came, and the children talked excitedly about the coming of Easter. Doris had told them the story of Jesus. And then to emphasize the idea of new life springing forth, she gave each of the children a large plastic egg. Now, she said to them, I want you to take this home and bring it back tomorrow with something inside it that shows new life. Do you understand? Yes, Miss Miller, the children responded enthusiastically. All except for Jeremy, he just listened intently. His eyes never left her face, and he did not even make his usual noises. Had he understood what she had said about Jesus' death and resurrection? Did he understand the assignment? Perhaps she should call his parents and explain the project to him. That evening, Doris's sink stopped up. She called the landlord and waited for an hour for him to come by and unclog it. After that, she still had to shop for groceries, iron a blouse, and prepare a vocabulary test for the next day. She completely forgot about phoning Jeremy's parents. The next morning, 19 children came to school, laughing and talking as they placed their eggs in the large wicker basket in front of Miss Miller's desk. As they completed their math lesson, it was time to open the eggs. In the first egg, Doris found a flower. Oh, yes, a flower is certainly a sign of new life she said. When plants peek through the ground, we know that spring is here. A small girl in the first row waved her arms. That's my egg, Miss Miller, she called out. The next egg contained a plastic butterfly, which looked very real. Doris held it up. We all know that a caterpillar changes and grows into a beautiful butterfly. Yes, that is new life, too. Little Judy smiled proudly and said, Miss Miller, that one is mine. Next, Doris found a rock with moss on it. She explained that moss, too, showed life. 
Billy spoke up from the back of the classroom. My dad helped me, he, he beamed. Then Doris opened the fourth egg. She gasped. The egg was empty. Surely it must be Jeremy's, she thought, and of course he did not understand her instructions. If only she had not forgotten to phone his parents because she did not want to embarrass him. She quietly set the egg aside and reached for another. Suddenly, Jeremy spoke up. Miss Miller, aren't you going to talk about my egg? Flustered, Doris replied, but Jeremy, your egg is empty. He looked into her eyes and said softly, yes, but Jesus' tomb was empty too. Time stopped. You could, you could hear a pin drop. When she, when she could speak again, Doris asked him, do you know why the tomb was empty? Oh, yes, Jeremy exclaimed. Jesus was killed and put in there. Then his father raised him up. The recess bell rang. While the children ran, ex excitedly ran out to the schoolyard, Doris cried. The cold inside, in, inside her melted away completely. Three months later, Jeremy died. Those who paid their respects at the mortuary were surprised to see 19 eggs on top of the casket, all of them empty. What a beautiful story that was. And uh, it's, um, it's amazing when you talk, talk about uh, children, little children. Do they listen? Do they hear? Do they understand the story? That's why it's so important for you parents to teach them the right way, to teach them about God, teach them about the Word. Now, you, you can teach them and you can make your children religious when they're young. You can't make them spiritual, but you've got to give them that head start. You've got to let them know right from wrong. You've got to, got to let them know that the Easter story is so important because Jesus died for them. And this story just shows you, not only was he a, he was a 12-year-old, he wasn't functioning at the right level, didn't make any difference. He knew exactly what he was taught and exactly what he believed. And uh, I think when I read that, I, I felt like, wow, man, this story is pretty close to my real story. And so this third story is not anonymous. This story is my story. And it's about uh, something that happened with me along these same lines. So this one was easy to write, uh, hard to remember, uh, because it was... Um, uh, is very different. Um, most most people knew me as a, a coach, knew me as a athletic guy, which I was, but I also taught special education uh, for four years, and and uh, this is my my story. In August of 1982, I was hired to teach special education at my alma mater, San Pedro High School. My specific area of instruction was learning handicaps, LH which took me on an amazing journey and ultimately revealed to me that I had a learning handicap of my own. I had a degree in kinesiology and not special education, but was hired because they wanted me to coach. I had to go back to school at night and earn an LH credential, which would allow me to continue to teach full time. Eventually, I learned that I had attention deficit disorder, which explained my entire life up to this point but we'll save that story for another time. But during the summer, I took a five-hour class which focused on developmentally disabled children. And I asked the professor, I said, hey, why do I gotta take this class? My degree is, is in LH. I'm not gonna be uh, dealing with the development, dis developmentally uh, disabled children. She simply said that this class would be seared in my memory for my entire life, and she was correct. I was given a young, physically handicapped teenager uh, as a one-on-one -on -one pupil, uh, to told to develop a, an individualized educational plan. This one had specifically be in the physical education area, uh, so he could uh, maintain a, a optimal physical health while working within his physical ability. Needless to say, this young man was a true blessing to me. And I thank God that I was able to be a part of his life, well, only for four, four weeks. 
But it was during this tour of Harlan Shoemaker. Harlan Shoemaker was a, a special school for handicapped in San Pedro. And um, most of the people that grew up still live in San Pedro. It's gone now. I think it's a, 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 a medical urgent care facility or something. But this was a school that whenever, when you drove by, you always saw the wheelchairs. You always saw special buses. Um, and it was for special needs kid and kids. And, and you know, you don't think of it. You, you, it doesn't enter your mind. You figure that's that school for them, and and you just keep on going. And and then I got into this program. And then I got into this class, and this class took us to this facility that I'd driven past so many times in my life. Bounced basketballs up the street. Never once thought about the people that uh, went to the school. Uh, our class was to visit a physical therapy session with children born into this world whose parents or parent were addicted to PCP. Uh, I didn't even know at that time what PCP was. I knew it was a drug. I knew it was bad. Um, but I didn't pay much attention. I didn't even know this program existed or thought twice about the effects of PCP on an unborn child. As we were ushered through this mini workout room, I couldn't hold back my tears. Here I, here I was, I was, I don't know, 30, 30 something years old, 30, 31, and um, with the rest of my classmates, you know, I'm sitting there, this big coach type guy, crying. And um, as were most other, other people in that class. Well, as we ushered through, each student had their own individual instructor and their own special program. A couple of kids could move their arms, legs with help. Some were actually coordinated enough to complete one exercise. Exercise. Then there were a couple students whose sole movement was moving their head and blinking their eyes. They were laying on a mat. 24 7 with the only thing they could do is to blink and try to move their head they understood because when they asked them to try to move their head they moved their head and um, and their ultimate goal was to try and roll over by themselves as I wiped away my tears I had a number of questions racing through my mind um, I thought you know why would God allow this to happen to a child? And how could a parent not see that damage, the damage that PCP could have had on their unborn child? This wasn't God's fault. It was simply sin. And we're all held accountable for our sins. But what about this child? What did this child do to deserve such a limited life? The question ate me up big time because not only did I know what wasn't going on in that school or who the students were at that school, it was almost like people wanted to forget that school existed. It's almost like people probably would want to forget that these kids existed. But they're just as much uh, God's children as we, we were. The, the people who who could run a hundred yards, shoot a basketball, hit a golf ball, do basic things in life. Uh, and here's these kids um, blinking their eyes was a great goal. Moving their head was a great goal. And these teachers that were cheering them on because they, they wanted them so bad to improve so that they could feel worthy of something. Man, that ate me up. Eats me up today. Um, I questioned myself. I, of course, uh, next question was, is this really part of God's plan? I believe so. Besides, who am I, who am I to question God? Well, I'm, a, I'm just a human. Who am I to question God? If I believe and have faith 
and know that there's an almighty God and know that he sent his son to die on the cross for me, then I got to understand, I got to believe that this was part of God's plan. And not that I want you to get the picture that God sit there and said, okay, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. No, sin happens. Sin happens. And even the sins of your father, the sins of those down the line, it happens. This young person was born like this because their parents were the ones that uh, were misguided. But, but God wasn't. God wasn't misguided. And even though these children were, were born with original sin, like we are, every person is, that's something we got from Adam. Um, and because their, of their mental capacity, limited mental capacity, they're too young to be held accountable. They're like children. The Lord's not going to hold a child that can't understand and choose for himself when he has the choice to understand what salvation is, what Jesus Christ did on the cross, who God is. If they can't make that decision, whether it's because of a, of a lack of mental ability or age, um, guess what? Man, they're, they're, they're going to be in heaven. That spirit... They're going to have a spiritual body. They're going to be in heaven, just like Billy Graham and you know all, all the, the the saints, Peter, Paul, uh, that are there before him. Spiritual bodies in heaven. <coughs> God doesn't make mistakes. And our final reward, when you stop and think about it, um, God tells us that the kingdom of God belongs to them, the children. Of Mark ten. 13 and 14, if you read that, it kingdom of God belongs to children. It belongs to, to us that have childlike faith. Childlike faith. And so this person whose mental capabilities were not up to par, and uh, like Jeremy Zag, who they thought, hey, his mental capabilities, now he knew God. He knew who God was. God knew who he was. And because we look forward to eternity with our, with our Savior, uh, along with every one of these kids that didn't have the opportunity to understand the word, God, God has them under his wing. They will be there. They will not only be there, I pray that their parents that made the mistake turn their life around and... Uh, and would be up there too because they'll know that soul. They'll know who that, that, that person was. The Lord doesn't make mistakes. And when I, when I looked at this story and I looked back at my life and I, I questioned God and I had those questions running through my head and I, I, I realized we're, we're only going to be here for a short period of time. Time flies. I'm, the older you get, the faster it goes. Believe me. And our next step is we will step into eternity. Now, it depends on which, where you're going to spend eternity. And that's when we come to this week, this weekend. We come to the fact that, that Jesus Christ died for mankind. He didn't, die for he didn't die for individuals. That's our choice. He died for mankind. He died, sent his son to die on the cross for mankind and for us to um, realize that it's up to us to choose. But those of us who are capable of choosing, we need to choose. We need to choose whether we want to follow Christ, whether we want to accept him as our personal savior, um, follow his commandments, try to pattern our lives and and, and his attributes and characteristics and the things he did to be able to share the gospel, the good news, that's, that's what we should be doing. That's our ticket. That's our step into eternity with Jesus Christ. If you go back and just look at each one of these stories, the first one is the son, the son, who will take the son? It's a simple question. They just related, related it to an auctioneer who was selling priceless, uh, priceless painting. But uh, all these rich people, 
didn't want the sun. They didn't want the they didn't want the lowly picture. They wanted they wanted the great collection. But the but the reward came by choosing the lowly person, the humble person. The reward comes from choosing Jesus Christ. Jeremy's egg. We're here at Easter time. It's an empty empty egg, empty tomb. Couldn't put it any better than Jerry, Jeremy put it. Yeah, he got killed. They put him in the tomb, but his father rose him up. Simple. It's simple, but, it, but he believed it. And then the third one is, you know, I, I will never question God anymore. And I won't question God because I realize that when it's all said and done, his ultimate plan is, is to give us all the opportunity to be with him because he loves us. God loves us so much, he sacrificed his son. He loved us so much. So my, my thing is, uh, for true believers, this weekend should be just part of another weekend in our lives. Be, to do the same thing, worship the same God, spread the same gospel, and hallelujah, because he is risen. And that's this weekend's message. Uh, these three stories touched my heart because they all hit a, hit a core part and hopefully they, they touched your heart and um, I recommend whenever you have the opportunity to visit uh, a special needs hospital, just go visit it. You won't be the same when you leave. Not a chance. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to share some stories that are relevant to this this weekend, this celebration that the world, those who, who believe in you, uh, celebrate this holiday, Lord. And those of you who are truly believers, Lord, celebrate it every day of their life. Uh, Lord, we ask you not to make this a, a ritual or a celebration where we have people going out and partying because it's a holiday and it's day off. We just ask you to open hearts this weekend. Give us opportunities to speak and to share our testimonies, Lord. And, and um, I just pray for this, this world. This world spinning out of control right now. And, and, um, and only you, you know where it's going. You know what's going to happen. Lord, just give us the courage and the faith just to follow you. It's that simple. Wherever you go, we, we follow, Lord. And that's... That's my prayer, is that we don't give up uh, on you, uh, succumb to the world. Just, Lord, let's just have our walk, be our walk with you. We ask this in your name. Amen. The beating of my heart is deafening, but I'm still listening in the silence after the storm. Your voice will bring me. together together